Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, real pleasure to have you here today, bra braving the uh, California rain. As a Canadian, I think you guys are a bunch of wimps, but otherwise, <laughs> very pleased you're here. Also, if you're a football supporter, you're welcome, but the uh, reception's over in the other room. Uh, we're here today for a, a much more exciting reason, uh, to welcome uh, Lisa Damore with a conversation with Nate Persley, which I'll be really excited to introduce uh, in a few moments. I want to take a, a moment now to uh, welcome you to the Cyber Policy Center's uh, event, uh, which has been generously funded by Project Liberty, um, a group that has been supporting a number of projects that we're doing here. The one that's most uh, relevant to the uh, event tonight is a brand new project uh, called um, Stanford Social Media uh, Teenagers and Mental Health. And it's headed up by our research director, Sunny Liu, who's um, right over there. And we have a number of uh, students and staff working on that. We're really excited uh, to uh, get this going. We'll be working entirely on that focus with a lot of resources being aimed at parents who, as we'll hear from Lisa today, are in a little bit of a squeeze being told that social media is bad for them and, and not having social media is bad for them. And so parents are in this really tough position. The last thing I'll say is uh, we just re um, finished the National Academies of Sciences report on social media adolescence and well-being uh, that came out in December. And so anybody that's interested in diving deeper into the literature, that has got a lot, can uh, put you to sleep for multiple nights uh, each week. It's nine chapters with a lot of recommendations. We looked at every single article on this topic and so happy to talk with people uh, afterwards. For today's event, uh, I'm really excited to introduce Lisa Damore. Uh, she is um, a special person for a number of reasons, but the number one is every time I talk to a parent who finds out what I do, yes, I, I lead the Stanford Social Media Lab, and yes, I, I have a kid, their number one question is like, what should I do? And if we're in a, a short window of time, I just say Lisa Damore. <laughs> and usually I have one of her books, uh, any three of them, all be New York Times bestsellers, um, the Emotional Lives of Teenagers, my particular favorite. I'll pull that out of my back pocket and just give it to them. And they, it's funny, they just immediately calm down and everything is okay. I think one of the main reasons that Lisa uh, and her message is so powerful, uh, and which is consistent with the research that we do, is she puts the kids at the center instead of the technology. And anything that you read of Lisa's, and I, I think even here today, uh, the kid is central and the family is central and the technology plays this other role, which is what is important to the kid and to the family. How can the technology support them rather than focusing on the technology alone? Um, with her today will be my colleague and co-director of the Cyber Policy Center, Nate Persley. He does, uh, he's really good at fireside chats. It's just uh, for some reason, him and his lawyer training, it just works out really great. So you're in for a real treat. Uh, please join me in welcoming Nate and Lisa. Well, thank you, uh, Jeff. So Jeff is much more qualified than I am to actually conduct this discussion, but I have dibs, <laughs> and that's because Lisa and I have known each other since we were 18 years old. Uh, and so- Actually, I was 17. <laughs> yeah, when I get, when I she was done. precocious even then, you know, she was, uh, and so we've known each other since we were, we were freshmen in college. And so uh, uh, much as Jeff is the actual expert on teen mental health and, and, and social media, uh, I'm going to take the reins today and uh, you know, call in this favor. So we are thrilled that you are uh, here with us today and, and, and spending the day at Stanford. Um, and we're going to have a sort of far ranging discussion about issues of uh, teen mental health and, and social media. Um, but I thought I would just start with like getting us grounded in thinking about the, I'm gonna call it a moral panic that exists today, but certainly some kind of panic about the state of teen mental health. And so um, where we benchmark the, the, the start of this concern, I mean, we've always, parents have always been concerned about their uh, teenagers, uh, but there, you read the news, there's, allegedly an ap epidemic mm -hmm. with, res uh, with respect to teen mental health. How do you see it? Is that true? When did it start? Um, uh, you know, how accurate is the depiction that we're getting uh, from mm -hmm. the media? Mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you for the work you do at your center. I'm very grateful for it. Um, okay, the adolescent mental health crisis. It's a really murky, murky situation. Um, 
prior to the pandemic, we were seeing rising rates of depression and anxiety in young people. And that was true using the best methods. Like we, we knew what we were seeing and we were seeing that. And then along comes the pandemic and it was awful for teenagers. I mean, it was awful for everybody. But if you think about it, teenagers have two jobs. One is to become increasingly independent and the other is to spend as much time with your friends as you absolutely can. And the pandemic just T-boned that experience. And so unsurprisingly, there was a ton of distress. And you know, the way we think about it is that's going to raise the rates of kids who move over into diagnosable disorders. So there's no question in my mind that teenagers have gone through an extraordinarily hard period. Um, there are a couple of other things to say, though, that don't get said enough. So when we think about the adolescent mental health crisis, it's actually sort of a two-part thing. One is the surging rates of distress and diagnosable disorders in teens. The other is that very few of us care for teenagers clinically. So even before the pandemic, it was very hard to find a good clinician for your teenager. And then along comes the pandemic and so many more teenagers are suffering. And our training takes a really long time. And then training to work with teenagers is a whole other layer of complexity. So we had this big surge and it's truly impossible to scale up the workforce to match the surge. So everybody talks about the surge, but there was this other issue of we weren't able to care for them. Okay. Then there is the issue, of, <laughs> you're asking like the thing I think about all the time, so it's going to be a long answer. On the matter of teenage suffering, I fear that there's an over-reporting and an under-reporting that happens simultaneously. So on the over-reporting, it was actually like a year ago right now, the CDC put out that giant report about how much suffering was being reported. Um, it was very heavy on girls, you know, that a lot of, you know, and, and the kinds of headlines you were seeing, three out of five girls are reporting, you know, record levels of sadness and hopelessness. Girls are twice as likely as boys, you know, to have all sorts of concerns, and we'll come back to that. I had a really hard time with how that was covered in the press because that report came out in February 2023. It was covered largely in the press as though it was new information. If you dug way down in some articles, they made it clear that report was based on data collected in September 2021. The findings about girls and sadness and hopelessness were on the back of a single question asked in September 2021. Have you felt sad or hopeless for two weeks or more in the last year? <laughs> exactly. Right. Okay. So that's a problem because the data could have also been reported as two out of five girls managed to not feel sad or hopeless <laughs> for two consecutive weeks through the thick of the pandemic. Right. And so there is this, and I think it's especially around girls, this tipping in the data and how it's reported of like, you know, great deal of suffering, which isn't to say like plenty of girls suffered a lot, but I, I actually ended up in some sort of tense conversations with some of my friends in journalism who were calling me for quotes. And I was like, I will give you a quote only if you put very high in the article that these are data collected in 2021 and this was a single question. I mean, I was just so, because it terrifies parents and terrifying parents does nobody any good. Okay, then, and this is going to be upsetting, but we can, we can talk about upsetting things. The same report was saying girls are twice as likely to report thinking about suicide and twice as likely to report try, um, attempting suicide. So very heavy girl, Leighton. We also know very clearly boys are twice as likely to die by suicide. But that's not what was in the data because they're not asking that. So. We have a story that is not entirely untrue that focuses very, very heavily on suffering in girls. And we have an untold story about suffering in boys. So I want to get at the gender component since you've you know, uh, certainly written about it. But, let, uh, but just to really level set here as to the state of um, the panic and how accurate it might, might, I mean, might be as compared to. So how did, leave aside the pandemic just for a yep. second. Um, because you've been, and, and I, and we should say, 
for those who don't know that Lisa, in addition to being you know, a, a New York Times bestselling author, is a practicing <laughs> psychologist uh, at the Laurel School uh, and um, at their, their center there, as well as um, I'm going to call you a quasi-journalist. So you, I think you have to take this on if you, if you, if you speak, you know, since she uh, works for CBS as well. And so she's correcting the record, I think, that often is, is coming out there. But, I, but just to get a sense of whether things are pretty bad, you know, bad yeah. to the point where we should be concerned. And I'll say, as, as, and I think a lot of the professors here would maybe say this, I've seen a change yeah. in the undergraduates coming through um, now than 10, 20 years mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. Um, why? What, 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 what do you think is, is the cause of that? Um, is it overdiagnosis? Is it, is, mm -hmm. is it, is it some perverse effect here? I mean, because it can't be all fiction, right? What, yeah. what, what do you think is going on? Um, probably four things I can identify and seven things I can't put my mm -hmm. finger on. Um, so the biggest scale I can say in terms of why we're seeing more young people struggling, let's just say struggling, I think for this generation, I think so much about how much input they are trying to metabolize. I mean, they are just taking on so much information. Um, I think about me in high school. Like, my world kind of ended at wham, right? Like, that was sort of what I was interested in, right? I mean, I was like, what's going on with wham, right? I have my own teacher. They are aware of crises in the Middle East and Ukraine and all variety of political things. They are worried about the environment. They are thinking about, you know, incredibly deep and complex topics around marginalization and privilege. I mean, like, and they are engaging it at this extraordinarily sophisticated, very high level. And they are also aware of what every kid they know in their circle is doing and they are aware of every single thing they are not invited to. I mean like they're taking in all of this information that I think is impossible to metabolize, right? And can hardly metabolize. And then this is actually surprisingly true across socioeconomic groups. What we expect of teenagers is much higher, right? When I think about what I had to do to get into college versus what my kid had to do to get into college, right? I mean it's like you can't even compare them. So if we just sort of think about like universal baseline stress increases, right? I think there's input and output questions. Um, I do think the pandemic was a major factor. And we can say it in a million different ways, but kids got to go to school, right? And, and I have no problem with the fact that they weren't, I, I get it, like from the yeah. medical side, I, like, I have no, I'm not gonna you know, judge that, but it's important to be in school. And you learn so much about yourself and socializing and working with adults who are not your family. I mean, and, and so it's funny, people, you know, there's a lot of hand wringing, understandably, about like, oh my gosh, they're behind or they're delayed or they missed out on things. And I'm like, well, it would be kind of weird if we pulled kids out of school for 18 months and they went back and there was no change. <laughs> We'd be like, why would we been requiring you to come all this time? <laughs> right? You know. So I think. It, it left a mark, it made a dent, like that is a reality. Um, then there is economic factors for families, right? I mean, these are kids who live in the context of family life and if stress in the family goes up, kids are gonna be on the receiving end of that. And then there is another issue, and then I'll stop here in terms of what I can think of right now. There is, and this is something I'm writing about a lot, there's confusion about what mental health really is. And we have come to a place, and I don't know if it's the commercialization of wellness or any variety of things, where a lot of people of all ages operate with the idea that mental health is about feeling good or calm or relaxed or at ease. Um, those are great things, that is not mental health. Mental health is about having feelings that fit the situation and managing those feelings well. But I think that for a lot of people and young people, you know, they have, um, you know, a bad day, something goes wrong, they feel a lot of distress. And now there's this additional layer of you're not supposed to feel distress. And so then they become distressed about distress. And that's going to make it worse. So I want to start talking about technology in a second, but you used the phrase the commercialization of wellness, which I've heard you say before, which yeah. I, I think it's a very important 
theme, and I want to, what exactly do you mean by that, and, and how does it fit into this picture? Um, it's funny, you know, I'm a psychologist, so I haven't usually, I, I've kind of come around to this way of thinking. I'm sort of like, well, follow the money, right? <laughs> you know, follow the money. There's a lot of money to be made in convincing people that somewhere out there, there is a Zen state of peace and joy. And if you can just get yourself the right app, the right weighted blanket, the right scented oil, the right, you can get there. Okay, I have zero problem with the apps, the oils, whatever. I think they are great in terms of helping us maintain equilibrium, right? You have a bad day, a yoga class is gonna help you find your feet again. You know, if you live in Cleveland, it's freezing cold, a nice weighted blanket's gonna help you feel better, right? <laughs> so I have no problem with the items. I worry about what I think is, I would just, I mean, this is a heavy word, sort of an insidious suggestion that peace and joy are to be had in an ongoing state and there's ways, there people are getting in your way and or there are things that can get you there. I swear by a weighted blanket, <laughs> but that's because I've got you know, a sleep problem. All right, so now, now let's, talk, let's start talking about technology. Um, and so, what, what, one of the arguments that's often made by some pretty famous uh, writers in this area is that, hey, you look at the advent of the smartphone or you look at the advent of the like button or you look at the advent of Facebook or something like this and boom, you see this, this trend that starts then with respect to whatever metric of mental health that we would point to. Um, wh what's wrong with that explanation? What, what mm. additional... Uh, uh, effect is the rise of certain kinds of technology um, in mm. the story about team mental health right now? So the reason we're so cautious when we're cautious about those kinds of things, and this is, you know, this is sort of stick in the mud, but this is good training, right, is that you can't make causal claims if you haven't done a controlled study, right? So that, like, that's, that's our concern when you're just pointing at timing questions. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing that I don't see unpacked nearly enough in those is we've also seen the same trajectories with reduction in sleep in teenagers. So if you look at the trajectory of worsening sleep in adolescents, it is the exact same trajectory of worsening mental health concerns in teenagers. And for me, like we have no question about that because we actually do controlled studies of teens and sleep and you keep them up all night and they're a disaster, you let them sleep and they're great. Like, I mean, we can see this. And so, I think I always feel more sure as a social scientist when I walk in through the sleep door with teenagers, because then I think the question is, well, why aren't they sleeping? Well, some kids aren't sleeping because they are taking four APs, and some kids aren't sleeping because they are working a job in addition to going to school to try to support the family. And some kids aren't sleeping because they have their phones in their room, and they're up all night on their phones. So I'm not against the idea that technology is a factor and a force in mental health concerns. I know it is. I just don't, I just want us to use the best of the social science we have available. So you uh, not only are, are consuming the social science here, but you're actually practicing, and so you see on the ground what's mm -hmm. happening. Mm -hmm. And so what have you seen with respect to, you know, the girls and boys that you deal with uh, in terms of the role that technology might be playing in accelerating some of these problems or amplifying them or exacerbating them? Well, let me sort of, I'm gonna pull it back. Um, I, have, I know a lot about kids in their lives with digital tech and have a lot I wanna share. Something I've been observing lately though is how hard it is to get teens to talk about it and how cautious they are bringing it up because they feel like we're coming for their phones, <laughs> you know? And so, and they're not wrong, right? I mean, I think a lot of our attitude, for lots of reasons, is this, you know, this is ruining everything, you know, which let's come back to that, because I think that is an issue, how we think about it. And so, part of the challenge is, any teenager will tell you they love their phone and they hate their phone, but they love their phone. And so when we're like, let's talk about your social media, they're like, how do I end this conversation as fast as absolutely possible, walking away with my phone, right? And so, <laughs> so I think 
the way I, I think, think many of us have dealt with. Uh, yes, exactly. Like and I'm like, what do I have to do to get out of this? I'm giving you nothing, right? <laughs> and I mean, if, my work, it's all about the relationship, right? Everything good happens in the context of a working relationship. And so I'll tell you what I'm hearing from teens, but I'll also tell you why I think we're not often hearing this from them. It's because the way we enter in that relationship, the way we try to have that conversation, they're already like, you're coming for my phone, I gotta get out of this, right? Okay, so I hear all sorts of things from teens. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about what they like. And, and I think it's important to talk about what they like because um, we're such a funny generation of parents, and this will go away soon, we didn't have this. And so it's easy to be hostile to it, right? Because look at them and look at these problems and we didn't have it and we didn't have these problems. It's so easy to make that equation. Um, if we had had it, we would use it exactly as they use it. Like there's no question in my mind, like no question. I think about how I operated with the phone and the landline in my house, right? Like <laughs> there's no question. Um, we also know from the research that what happens socially for kids online tends to mirror what's happening in their lives. So kids who have good, working, happy friendships, which a lot of kids do, that carries over to their phones. And they're having a good old time there too. And I think given especially how busy kids are, it's a place where they actually can have a, a nice social experience without getting together. Um, the other thing I think about that's very easy to criticize is all of the mindless entertainment, right? The cat videos, <laughs> the dance videos, the sports clips, right? I mean, like all of that. And I think we can be sort of um, judgy about that. And I try to think about, I watched so much Gilligan's Island as a kid, <laughs> right? Like so much Gilligan's Island. It's okay for kids to have mindless entertainment. Right, it is. And then I think especially, these are kids who are producing so much more work, so much more is asked of them. They're not really watching that much TV often. Often it is, let me watch a few cat mm -hmm. videos. So I think we have to, especially if we're gonna try to have fruitful relationships with them, I think being respectful of the fact it serves a purpose, it works well for them, it's not all bad. Um, so they'll tell me that, right, that it's fun. and. Um, it's fun with their friends. It's a, it's a nice way to sort of just let their minds rest. And they will tell me. Here's when I ask, the way I'm often asking, I'm like, what are you seeing online that is hard to look at or you feel is concerning? Like, I will ask them mm -hmm. that. And if you ask a teenager a very straight question and they can tell there's no gotcha, they will absolutely tell you. And the thing I am hearing that I feel concerned about, and I don't get concerned easily, is that even kids who are not looking for worrisome content, like let's put those kids over here, right? Kids who are looking for diet content or looking for hate content. Even kids who aren't looking at it, it's in their feeds. And I, I, I'm amazed at how often, like I've, I've been talking with some teenage boys, and like I know these guys are not looking for Andrew Tate content, but I know these guys are friends with boys who look at that stuff, and Andrew Tate stuff is showing up in their feed, um, or diet stuff, or fitness stuff. And so kids are in one of two categories. And this is, this is, for me, the most concerning. Either they're using their technology while actively having to withstand content that is problematic and they know it, right? People are saying racist stuff, people are saying sexist stuff, you know, I'm look, you know, I see stuff that I know is wrong and not okay. I'm trying to go right past it for the stuff I came for. Okay, that's not a not thing. Like, that's a problem in its own right. Or they are like, what is this, right? And then they work their way deeper into an area we don't want them in. And my worry about the algorithms, my worry about kids who do start to tip down these more worrisome alleys um, is actually about norms. That teenagers are more vulnerable to norms than kids or adults, right? Like my current Instagram feed is all folding hacks, 
right? Like <laughs> folding clothes. Oh. Like, okay. yeah, how to fold clothes, how to fold them this way. I love looking at them. It has in no way changed how I fold things, right? <laughs> like, I fold the way I fold. Like, I'm 53. Like, that, that is solved, but I love looking at it. <laughs> you know? But teenagers are more likely to change their behavior in response to perceived norms. So, like, the norm that we're seeing, and this is, I consider it comparatively benign, um, the skincare routines, right? So, skincare, like, 14 step skincare routines have become normed. And suddenly, everybody's daughter is doing 14-step skincare routines, right? So the, the problem with the algorithms is it presents the same thing over and over and over and over and over. And if you're a kid, that will bend your behavior. And it can, you know, I, whatever skincare, but, um, you know, lengthy fasting, use of supplements, Hyper fitness. I want, yeah, I want to uh, yeah. go down. I mean, so, but I want to sort of just crystallize the things that you're worried about, things that you're yeah. not worried about. Yeah. So, so if you had to sort of give your, I want to say top ten, but the, yeah. but, but the the marquee concerns versus things that you're not worried about. How would you, how would you describe? Okay, it? so not worried about it, but I want to come back to it. I don't worry about the fact that kids do have social fun online, and then I mean, then there's the very, very major, but you know, um, we don't need to spend. You know, we just, I just want to note it, like, also kids who are marginalized who have no other way to have community and find community online that is literally life-saving for some people. I mean, so there's that. Um, I'm not worried about <laughs> goofy, benign time-wasting. Um, I'm not, I mean, also, like, when you engage teenagers around topics of, like, privilege or marginalization, the level of discourse they're bringing to it is because of their online activity, right? That they're watching arguments be made, they're watching criticisms of arguments, they're watching, you know, like, there's a sophistication in how they talk and think that it, like, we were nowhere near. And that, that's also a function of their activity online. I worry about sleep, hugely, and how it's disrupted by technological stuff. I worry about kids having to withstand a lot of negative stuff, even if it never shows up as a diagnosis in that kid, I worry about just the wear and tear of, of resisting stuff that you know is not okay. And then I worry about, I mean, we saw an explosion of eating disorders in the pandemic like we've never seen. My colleagues were saying kids were coming in so sick, mm -hmm. like so much more ill than anyone, you know, and. I worry about that. Eating disorders are so incredibly dangerous. You know, you're kind of in recovery for the rest of your life if you recover. Um, and the hate stuff, there is so much hate. The, there's hate of all forms. I feel like the great unreported story is um, the misogyny stuff. I, I feel like a lot, I am hearing from a lot of schools that their sixth grade boys are rolling in talking Andrew Tate. And I'm here, Andrew Tate is, I know, I know, let me, um, yeah, so Andrew Tate is like not a good person. Um, Andrew Tate is a flagrant misogynist who was deplatformed and convicted, but is basically like picture the most, I mean, I don't usually use this term because for lots of reasons, but like, if you were going to use the term toxic masculinity, this would be a good use of it, right? So all about women, they're, you know, lesser men, awesome muscles, cars, sex, drug, money, right? I mean, it's, it's just very, very um, lowbrow, I guess would be one way to say it. But um, somebody who really, for guys who are not feeling good about themselves, has a lot to offer. And so... But it's, I mean, it's not marginally not okay. I mean, it is way, way out of line. And last April was the first time I was at a school, and the sixth grade teachers asked me about it. I was like, excuse me? And I was like, what is wrong with this broken school? Okay, at which point I then hear it. It was a school in Ohio. Then I hear it from a school in D.C., a school in Boston, a school in New York. I mean, like, I was like, okay, this is everywhere. 
and going largely undiscussed. I want to I want to get back to that and particularly thinking about differences between girls and boys' experiences online. But let, let me just start with something that I think you gestured toward, which is you know, one of the arguments about the connection between technology and and uh, declines in teen mental health would be. Um, the mode of self-comparison, mm -hmm. right? You mm -hmm. go online, you see someone's got a great life, you feel worse about your own. Mm -hmm. Someone puts their most beautiful self online, particularly with, with teen girls, and then you mm -hmm. feel uh, worse about your image, you know, mm -hmm. that might have a connection to the anorexia and stuff you're talking about. How much of a role is, is sort of self-comparison playing in, say, um, the way, you know, the effect of technology on their psychology? I think it's real. I think it's real. I think um, on that one, that's what it means to be a teenager, right? Is that you're always yardsticking against the people around you. And so I feel like what it's done is it's taken a really painful aspect that is natural to adolescence and then just amplified it. But even in the self-comparison thing, we have all of these research studies on girls and body image and the impact of looking online. There's a body image issue for boys too, but I don't know that we're studying it. Mm -hmm. And I think about um, one of the things I remember learning in my research methods class in graduate school was like this like story of um, there's a, a policeman's walking down the street in the night at night and he sees a drunk guy. Do you know this story? Looking under a lamp post on the on the sidewalk, and the policeman's like, "What's going on?" And the guy's like, "I dropped my keys." And the policeman says, did you drop them here? He goes, no, but the light is here, right? So, so I worry, right, we keep, again, like girls, you know, we are studying girls and body image. Mm -hmm. And so then we have all of these studies showing girls have body image concerns that are, I don't doubt it, exacerbated by exposure to looking at, you know, not just, it used to be models, now it's the kid who sits next to you. I mean, it's all mm -hmm. that. Anecdotally, and it's it's frustrating to me that it's anecdotal, right? I want the research to catch up. Boys are like deep into lifting, deep into, I mean, I can tell who has sons, right? I mean, like they're suddenly looking at image after image after image. Like the, I, I we just did a podcast on this and I, so I, I try to like mess with my algorithm and I, and I ask, I'm like, what are the hashtags? What are the, you know? So somebody told me, go look up gains, like hashtag G-A-I-N-Z. And so I got myself into this, and like the number of photos of adolescent boys taking pictures of themselves in the bathroom with their shirts off and flexing their abs, I'm like, we're not studying this. And so it's real, but I sort of feel like we have the lamppost problem right mm -hmm, now. Mm -hmm. You know, like, but we're used to studying girls and body image, so we don't know. So, I, so let, now let's talk about the different sort of online experiences of girls and boys. Yeah. And, and, and so the, the self-comparison stuff um, and the connection to eating disorder is one thing that particularly I think we've focused maybe on, on mm -hmm. girls and you're explaining how it, it might, might be uh, beyond that. But in your experience, mm -hmm. um, sort of what, is the, what are the differences in the relationship that girls and boys are having to technology and the things mm. that we should be concerned about? You've, you've mm -hmm. obviously touched on it right now, but is there is there other things that you see, in, in, in particularly in the way it's it's working with you know friend groups, uh, mm. uh, intimate relationships, mm -hmm. things like that? Mm -hmm. um, I think girls do have a harder time, just from my own experience, on the sort of the socializing side. Um, I I think that it's all there's problems everywhere if you want to you know look at it hard. Boys, I think, are often, when they're using digital technology, doing more gaming, doing more gaming together. I think that there's sort of a mediating factor. I think, you know, there was early days in the pandemic, I was like, okay, there are a whole lot of sixth grade boys who are living their best life right now, right? I mean, they're like, you know, playing Fortnite, <laughs> you know, like, they're like, this could go on forever. And I was like, let them do it. Like, they can't do anything else, right? You. I, this was absolutely for we have two boys, and I have yeah. to say, video games were an absolute lifeline during the pandemic. Absolute they, lifeline. They were, they were able to. That was the way they socialized with their friends. Yeah, yeah. and it was. And now they weren't playing with Andrew Tate, you know, or, or, well, or, but, or you know, but but. Uh, yeah. But then the other thing that actually comes on in those online gaming environments is like all of the like, for lack of a better word, like shit talking, right? That goes yeah, yeah, on, yeah. 
that a lot of it has slurs built in. Yeah, yeah. Right? And so then, you know, they're hearing, seeing, so all these slurs, all these slurs. And then, again, norms mm -hmm. and shifting norms. And so then kids show up at school and they're using the N word casually. And you're like, where did that come from? And you're like, it came from gaming. Mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So no one's getting off the hook here, right? I mean, right, there's, right, you right. know, so there's that. I think for girls, um, what is so tricky about girls, I, I, I don't think this is not true for boys. I think it is more true for girls. Um, the subtlety of how girls can be hard on one another um, is very painful. Um, and this was actually nicely described in a recent New York Times article by um, somebody at Harvard um, saying, you know, that there's, girls are left second guessing themselves constantly. You know, that there's just sort of a like and an unlike something or, you know, leave someone unread or whatever. And so there's, it's, it's not as um, kind of direct and, and, and it's vague and it, I think, creates a great deal of anxiety. I don't think that doesn't, I think that also happens with boys. I think it's a more amplified experience for girls. So uh, let me talk about a somewhat hard thing that, that and it's something that we study here. We, we, there's a whole set of research in the Cyber Center dealing with child exploitation and things like that. Mm -hmm. But I want to talk about pornography and, yeah. and, and, and the role that this plays because that is one it's technological huge. difference, right? Yeah. And and um, you know, but but I but there's the pornography side and, and the way that boys are consuming it. But then also, um, the I, that's why I was trying to uh, steer you toward maybe intimate relationships yeah. and how technology oh, yeah. works in that. So that the way that kids are are forming relationships online and how that. Um, is very different than what yeah. preceded it. And so what are you seeing you know, with your, your kids that you counsel and uh, what should we be concerned about or not? Um, so if there's one thing kids will not bring up, it's porn. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. And, and, I, and I, I think that's on fire. And, and I, I, I don't say but that. By all accounts, it is. I mean, yeah. this is you know, something that, uh, I mean, especially when you talk about how we don't study boys, uh, and, and this is you know, a big yeah. part of that. It's know. huge. And, I tell this story in um, The Emotional Lives of Teenagers. So I married into a Catholic family, and um, it's this very, like, Jesuit Ohio Catholicism. I'm like, I can do this, right? You know, it's very <laughs> inclusive and generous and kind. And um, I really like the priest. I haven't converted. I'm sort of Jewish Episcopal nothing, but, like, I, I like this priest. And... Um, I was asked to speak, it was actually when Under Pressure came out, my second book, I was asked to speak um, to the parish school. And I said, sure. And my views on all things romantic are pretty progressive. And I really respect this priest very much. So it was a, after a Saturday mass, I caught him, Father Tom, in the, in the um, aisle of the church. And I was like, I know I'm speaking to the parish school. I just, you know, I want to talk with you about how I intend to talk about relationships, you know, and I lay out this very progressive thing, you know, because I feel like I'm his guest and I want to make sure, I guess, for lack of a better word, that it's kosher, right, for me to <laughs> say these things. And he's like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He's like, you also have to talk about porn. And I was like, okay, <laughs> say, say more. And I, and I was like, he said, I just took confession from 200 boys at this Catholic boys' school. And he was probably just <laughs> <laughs> Okay, actually, and this was not in the book. This was not in the book. So here, and I was like, you did. And he was like, yeah. And I was like, okay, for, let me like back up a little bit more. <laughs> You're like, where is this going? Okay. So when I was writing Untangled, I, um, a mom in my community said, you need to go look at what the ninth grade boys are looking at. And so she sent me to Pornhub. So I sign on to Pornhub. OK, if you have not looked at the porn lately, it is not the soft erotica you are picturing. It is severe and violent. It is actually grotesque. I mean, like, I'm like, I was like, oh my god, right? Like, you know, oh my god. It is, it all looks like rape. Everybody's an anatomical outlier. Everybody is. The women are squealing with delight on something that looks like unbelievably violent to me, right? So like, and I hate telling you this, but you need to know this, right? So I 
I was like looking at it, and I mean, just to be really, since I've gone down this road, I might as well keep going. <laughs> So, I mean, when I say anatomical outlier, I mean, like, the equipment involved in this, I'm like, I've never seen anything like that in my life, right? <laughs> you know? And I was like, what is it like to be a 12-year-old boy just getting to know your own body, and this is your introduction to what's involved in all this? Like, what does that feel? Like, what's that experience? So, Father Tom had the answers. Okay. So, I'm like, let me ask you this. <laughs> you know, that's, and since you just heard all this information, I'm like, do they talk about the bodies? And, the, and he's like, yeah, they're really, they feel awful about it. And I'm like, do they talk about not wanting to look at it? He's like, yeah, and then they can't stop themselves. So like, I got all this information, and we, we live two blocks from the church, so I'm walking home, and I said to my husband, I'm like, nobody knows more about what's going on with adolescent boys and porn than Father Tom. Like, I mean, he has all this information. So, okay, so where was I going with all this? So there is, a lot to worry about. Okay, so we know boys are looking at it. We know girls are looking at it, but not as compulsively. Um, we also know kids are seeing it. There's a lot of back of the bus, you know, yeah, yeah. stuff. And we also know it is changing sexual behavior. That stuff that, um, like anal sex, has increased mm. we, when we look at the data on this. Um, I think there's been some ability to link that to increased exposure to porn. Um, it's worrisome. It's really worrisome. And, but I will tell you, the biggest worry I have is kids are over here kind of swimming in it, and adults are over here not bringing it up. And I, that, that concerns me. So I want to ask you one last question that we'll open up for, for people, uh, which is um, what do you what, what, what do you tell parents? You know, what, 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 if you're, if you're <laughs> having terrified uh, you and all, not, and, and not, yeah. not a, let's yeah. let's move off pornography. Yeah, yeah, uh, seriously. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For those of you who will be joining us online, you know, yeah. we're, we're, it's not our yeah. sole focus here. But but yeah. um, uh, so you've got a lot of parents in the room here. When, yeah. when when they're worried about their kids with technology, give them what tools are you yeah. going to give them to to uh, deal with some of these problems? Yeah. Okay. So. I think number one rule, and some of you may be like, ah, oh, that ship has sailed, uh, go slow. Right? I think that um, the later everything can happen developmentally with tech, the better. I think it's very common. I would have made this error if I didn't do what I do for a living. You know, for by fourth, fifth, sixth grade, depending on your community, for a kid to be like, I need a phone, everybody's got a phone, everything's happening on my phone. For parents to be like, oh, here we are, and to hand over a phone that has apps and a browser and very few rules about where it lives. Um, that's actually a, a fixable moment. Easier to get out in front of. So I would say for starters, especially those of you with younger kids, when your kid says, I need a phone, I think the question is, do you really need a phone to stay in touch with the friends you have and to maintain the friendships you really have? And there will be a point where kids say, actually, yes. And they'll be right, You know that all of the plans are being made on text. I don't know what's happening. I'm not included, right? Because you know, sixth graders aren't going to be like, oh, and call so and so's mom, right? I mean, like they, they reach who they can reach. Kids need friends. Social media is hard on kids. Social isolation is hard on kids. But I think the rule is give them the bare minimum communication technology they need to stay in touch with their friends. So um, I have a seventh grade daughter, and um, when she got a phone, I was like you are getting a phone, it has no browser, it has no apps, no social media apps, it never crosses the threshold of your bedroom ever. Um, and the nice thing is when the kid is lobbying, they're like, deal, yeah. right? They will agree to anything in that moment. And, and I think parents lose a lot of leverage that they actually had. Um, and then I have said to her, and this is sort of how I see it, I'm like, you are on texting alone until you cannot maintain your in real life friendships with only texting. And I have said to her, I trust that the day will come where you come to me and say, it's all on Snap. I don't know what's going on because it's all on Snap. And I, tr I really hope that day is when you're 15 or 16 years old. That that is, you know, I, and, and we will do one social media platform at a time only because you need it and hopefully because you're older. And the age issue developmentally 14 is a watershed year, neurologically. 
13 and under, no matter how smart they are, they are comparatively concrete thinkers. They take things in pretty whole. They don't question it enough. Um, 14 and then later, kids become, actually, they become more skeptical, right? Like they stop buying what we're selling. It gets harder to parent them, right? Because you're like, do this, and they're like, but why, mm -hmm. right? That's what you want online. Right? If a kid is looking at stuff online, the more skeptical, the more they're able to turn it around and look at it from different perspectives, like the better. And um, delay, 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 and then make it clear, like, I'm here to help. I'm here to help. I'm here to keep algorithms from taking you places you don't want to go, or even just keeping you there longer than you meant to be. Like, I, I, I'm your partner in trying to help manage the downsides of this while recognizing there are meaningful upsides for kids. So I want to open it up, but, I, but there's something that, that you said earlier about how like all apps aren't the same, or that people yeah. are you know, that that they're using you know they're watching YouTube instead of Gilligan's Island or something mm -hmm. like that. You know, yes, it's a problem, of course, if they're watching some of the problematic stuff that you're talking about, whether it's porn or hate or, or all that. Um, but that it, it's really hard. I mean, even if we don't have phones, they've got everyone surrounded by the screens, whether it's a tablet mm -hmm. here or a computer there. Um, uh, but that but that it's, it's hard for us right now because it's so different than our experience yeah. growing up to say, all right, well, this is the, this is the okay, since it's all on the same platform, right? Yeah. This is the okay use, use. You can look at YouTube, yeah. know, even if you're 13, um, um, but, not, but you know, not social media. Yeah. Social media. Um, yeah, and I, I think also you gotta know your kid, yeah. right? I mean, I have clinically had families make different rules for different kids in the same family. Mm -hmm. Because there are some kids who will, you know, who need a lot of guardrails, and there are other kids who, like, really can handle themselves quite well. But keeping it out of kids' bedrooms. Yeah. Well, explain why. why yeah. Again, I mean, I think I yeah. know the answer there. Yeah. I mean, and I know it's hard, and so I'll help you out. If you're like, that ship has sailed, I'll help you out. Yeah. But <laughs> how? I don't, okay. Well, so first of all, I mean, well, one how is it shouldn't be in your bedrooms either, right? I mean, like, no, I mean, we know this. Like, we know this. And we even have, there's one interesting study that showed that um, you don't sleep as well in a room with a phone that you use all day because you are resisting its siren call even while sleeping. Um, so one of the ways is you say, like, okay, this lady from Cleveland came and she said you couldn't have your phone anymore. None of us can have our phones anymore. Like, we're all taking them out of our bedrooms. Like. It's, a, it's, I mean, and it truly, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not that prescriptive, but it is a physical health issue. It is a mental health issue. Like, th we know that. And so you could make the argument if you just go from the perspective of, like, we're all taking it out, is, like, we get in the car, we put on our seatbelts. If we put on our seatbelts and don't ask you to put on your seatbelt, like, that's not us doing our jobs. Like, we're taking it out of the, you know, room for our mental and physical health. We're not going to, like, not take it out of your room. You know, like, so that's a how. Um, let me say, if you're like, yeah, I'm not doing that. <laughs> um, I think the other way to think about this is, like, is it an issue for your kid? Right? And there are kids. I have a kid at college now who, you know, they, put off, they turn off notifications. They shut it down. It is not keeping them up. It's serving as a good alarm. It's serving as a good little music player. It's not messing with their sleep. Okay, I'm not going to tell you to go war, to war with your kid about this if it's not an issue. But if you're like, no, he's ragged as all get out. She's taken calls all night, right? Then it's a fight worth having, I actually think. OK. So it, here, let me, here's why I really like the rule of like it just doesn't go in rooms. OK, so first of all, the sleep issue. Like it's major, and we know that it interferes with sleep. Second of all, the dumbest things I've seen kids do on phones is at 2 in the morning. <laughs> right? I mean, because they're like tired, and their impulses are strong, and their brakes are weak. So in terms of just like making regrettable choices, two in the morning is a like prime time. And the third, and this gets to something we haven't touched on at all. We used to talk about this all the time. We don't talk about it enough. It's all public and it's all forever. And I think there's something structural about if you only use technology in the public spaces of the home, that it can, it's a little bit of a good reminder Right? Whereas if you can close the door and squirrel away, I'll just put it this way. Like, I'm sure nude selfies have sometimes somewhere been taken in a kitchen. 
I think it's comparatively rare. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I think it's something when you have this like sense of this is secret and just me. And so saying you don't use these technologies in private spaces because none of it's private anyway. Mm, right? right. And if you want a private phone call, like we will make that happen. But yeah. I know with the students here, trying to convince them that it's not their own private internet is mm -hmm. really hard, yeah. you know, because yeah. then that they, they don't think about the long term. So I want, I'm, Jeff, I'm going to turn to you for the first uh, response uh, question, uh, and then others as you, uh, uh, if you have questions, raise your hand. We'll, we'll go for just about five, ten minutes, and then we've got a reception afterwards and a book signing opportunity. Right. So, mm -hmm. Jeff. You have the microphones ready to go. So I'll ask uh, the first question. So first, Lisa, thank you so much. Um, one of the things we've been thinking about a little here is, oh yeah, thanks. <laughs> is um, non-custodial adults. So mm. these are like the aunts and uncles and the baseball coach and, or hockey coach, ideally. <laughs> and um, the pandemic really sort of undermined a lot of those mm. relationships. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any thoughts on, on how we can uh, help young people build those up again so that when they have that question they can't ask the parents about, mm -hmm. they go to the uncle or the coach mm -hmm. rather than social media, which may lead them to mm. these mm -hmm. problematic spaces? Um, first of all, I think you're right. I, I had this really interesting, I got to be in the room with all of the um, superintendents of all the huge districts in the country, and I was sitting next to the superintendent for Chicago City Schools, and he said, you know, when kids were on lockdown, it's not just that they didn't come to school, it's that they lost their relationship with their coach, their drama teacher, their, you know, the hall monitor who knows them, and ask them what, you know, if they saw the game this weekend, that it was the loss of all of those things and those you know, extraordinarily powerful, especially for teenagers, relationship with adults who are good, caring adults who are not your parents, right? Like that's so essential to adolescent development. And so um, I think a lot when we talk about like mental health interventions for kids, I'm like, it's arts programming. It's mentorship things. It's jobs. It's stuff that puts them in the path of caring adults who have their back. So I, I think it's, I wish that we talked more about that as a fundamental force for mental health in teenagers. And I think it's both around then like, you know, how to use, you know, how to answer questions that you're not going to ask online or you shouldn't ask online. Um, but I think that it's interesting, the longer I've worked as a psychologist, the more um, elastic my understanding of what's therapeutic is. And sometimes I'm like, that kid needs therapy, and sometimes I'm like, that kid needs a job. Right, like, <laughs> and in terms of, what, you know, and it, yeah, totally. because the job will do all sorts of things. Lost yeah. Actually. Great, I'll ask one last one, then we'll hand it over to the audience. Um, I guess Nate and I probably can't let you leave here without <laughs> asking the cyber policy, policy question. Okay. So as a psychologist, I've struggled with this. You've been today focusing uh, as you always have on the family and the people. But if there was one thing you would say from, say, a policy point of view, maybe around the platforms, or is there anything that you would share with us that would be your take on that? I would have an off button for the algorithms. Like, full stop. If we picture a social media environment that's your kid friends, your kid's friends, where it started. That's a very different universe. Yeah. yeah, it was 20 years ago this weekend that uh, Facebook started, and it was about six years later that the news feed happened. I remember the moment yeah. because my whole class just started acting weird, and I was like, what's <laughs> going on? <laughs> like, oh, this news feed, they're showing what other people do. Very yeah. upsetting, and then within three days, everyone's like, this is awesome. Yeah. Um, but you're right, like, there used to be a point where But it was if you just could just immature. toggle it yeah. off. Yeah. Right? I want algorithm, I don't want algorithm. Right. right. Well, I should say Jeff and I are part of a big project here at Stanford about how to design your own algorithm. So right. it's something, hopefully okay. we'll make a, make a, make a difference there. Yeah. yeah. So uh, any, uh, why don't we go right over here. Oh, uh, actually, uh, all right, here and then over there. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for just being you. Um, okay, I have a couple questions. One is that you, you said um, for pornography, like we should just talk about it. And I've mm. never talked about it mm -hmm. with my son. And I would love to just mm -hmm. know what you envision sure. that looking like, how to open that conversation. Um, and the second one was, I find the challenge and the, um, the biggest uh, problem in my house with social media is that it's like a constant thing. Mm -hmm. They're like, 
doing this, they're doing this, they're doing this, they're doing this. It's like he's checking this, he's checking this, he's checking this. It's, it's this constant, it's the whole day. And you watch Gilligan's Island, you did not like watch a minute of Gilligan's mm-hmm. Island and then go mm-hmm. do your homework and then watch another minute. Mm-hmm. And I find that that um, has exacerbated, well, mm-hmm. I feel like everybody says I have ADHD now. Mm-hmm. I think it's because it's very hard to concentrate. It's hard for them to focus on something for very long. My son was a prolific reader. He mm-hmm. barely reads anymore. I, I just, I think mm-hmm. this kind of, it's it's affected this long-term concentration. Mm-hmm. So I just wondered if you could speak to that aspect of it mm-hmm. and kind of what you're mm-hmm. seeing there. And mm-hmm. yeah. I second that. Okay, <laughs> so ages ago, so I used to write regularly for the Times, I still write, but not regularly for the Times. I wrote a piece called How to Talk to Teens About Pornography. And I like gave you the script. So if you Google Demore, weirdly, pornography. and pornography, <laughs> and New York Times, watch what what <laughs> by the top, it'll come up. And to hit some high points, it's basically saying, you know, listen. I mean, you you should assume you've seen it, right? I mean, and just say, here's what you need to know. This is not what tender, loving relationships look like. This is fundamentally exploitive. Watching it is participating in the exploitation. I feel that way about it, at least. You can decide it, what of this you want to say. Um, you can also say this puts you in a really tricky position because it's also going to, it's very arousing, right? And so you're going to have your body react to something your mind knows is wrong. And that's a terrible position to be in, right? And then, so, I mean, it's all laid out there. So it's a conversation, if you want to have it, that I've scripted. Um, okay. The concentration issue and the um, disruption question. So kids have to do their homework, and they have to do their homework in a focused way. That we know that routinely interrupting yourself is like having somebody else interrupt you. Cognitively, it's got the same effect. I find real value in helping kids use their phone to set a 20-minute timer for focused work. And when they want to, like, step away, like they look at their phone, and I've, I do this for myself too, and it's like four minutes and 37 seconds, like can you make yourself do it? And usually they can. And so setting the expectation of just work 20 minutes and then check it, work 20 minutes, often does a lot. Like it helps them build the muscle, right? So that's for studying. I mean, you can have expectations about, you know what, let's all put our phones away. I mean, I think hold yourself to the same standards and that can work. Um, I think those are the, the things I would say for now. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah, out there and then, then to you over here. Yeah. Hi. Thank you so much for your leadership. I have a question regarding surveillance apps mm. and techniques that mm. parents might use mm-hmm. for their mm-hmm. kids' technology. I'm just curious to know um, how they can be helpful versus harmful mm-hmm. in the relationships between parents and their children. So before you give the mic away, so surveillance in terms of seeing their activity or in terms of tracking where they are physically? Seeing their activity. Okay. So I don't know a ton about them, to tell you the truth. But I would say as a general rule, if you're going to use them, your kid needs to know you're using them. And so I trust that you can't set them up any other way. And I think there's value in that. Um, I think the value in I am surveilling it is that it actually puts a speed bump in. And I remember at like, times when I've learned stuff from teenagers. Um, so for a long, long time, and I'm pretty much wrapped up, but I, I've got a still a long, close relationship with this school that you mentioned. Um, there, so I'm in Cleveland. There's many private schools. And at another private school, there was just this really ugly thing that blew up online. And it was a competitive school with our school. And the head of the school where I consulted said to our students, none of you are to be part of this. Like, do not comment, do not touch it. It's as if we do not exist in this universe. Like, she just wanted our school to stay totally out of this. And to my amazement, the students did. They did. So then about two weeks later, a week and a half later, the most, like, um, mature, (laughs) stately uh, senior girl came to see me about something else. I mean, you know those, like, those high school girls, and there are some boys, but I know the girls better, who are like, they could like run corporations, right? You know, they're like completely like pulled together. So she asked me, you know, about something and I solved it. And I said, Emily, while you're here, like, can I ask you about how it is that nobody got in on that thing going on at the over school? She goes, 
oh, you want to. She's like, oh, you want to. She's like, I wanted to. And then you remember we were told not to. And then you realize it was probably a bad idea anyway. And I was like, okay, if this 18-year-old girl with this level of control needs the rule handed down to not do it, I was like, the rules help. So I think the true value of the surveillance apps is not, is that kids will be like, I don't want to get caught. And then they'll be like, oh, and that's probably a bad idea. So I think that's the value. The flip of it, I will say, is if you feel like you've got to closely monitor your kids' online activity, they probably are not ready for online activity. right? If you feel like you can have this, but I have to be surveilling it really closely, I, I think that, that's, a, that's a flag for me. Because um, it's very hard to keep track of all that they're up to. So. Let's go right over. Did, uh, here, as as uh, but but how accurate do you think parents' understanding of their kids' online behavior is? <laughs> I mean, yeah, because no. it would be. Uh, I tend to think that uh, I don't want to come out as really pro surveillance here, but I'm kind of pro surveillance. <laughs> You're pretty pro surveillance. I know it's just yeah. like you know, just as a deterrent. I mean, yeah, as it's a, a deterrent mainly because you know, <laughs> uh, I mean, we. we, we track our kids' movements, uh, 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 yeah. and then one changed his setting, so he happened to be in Kyoto one day, you know, <laughs> on time, so that it looked like you. But yeah, yeah no, I mean, but, but, but in, in a sense, how, how good do you think parents are in estimating what their kids are generally doing online, do you think? I don't know. Okay. I mean, but it's also what's interesting is, like, I have two girls, mm -hmm. you have two boys, right? Um, I happen to know my older daughter, who's the one who, you know, she's very cautious, yeah. reserved kid right so the, it was very easy yeah. you know because I like I'm like she doesn't even like talking to people she likes <laughs> right <laughs> I mean she's a terrific kid but she's an introverted yeah. kid right so I so I think it's a little like you got to know your kid right and have a sense of that yeah. right here hi nice to yeah. meet you um so just to piggyback on the previous question how do you feel um about the pa parental control apps Mm -hmm. Because all of us in my family, I also have two daughters, we have all iPhones. And mm -hmm. from my phone, I control what is the time limit for all the apps, mm -hmm. what, type, what apps are allowed or not allowed, mm -hmm. what they can install, what people they can contact, um, and the basically bedtime and mm -hmm. wake up time. Is it a good or bad? I think it's great. I think it's great. I mean, I think what you're doing is you're putting guardrails around it. Kay. Yes, but they work and doesn't work, depend on the kid, as you said. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's constant fight. Well, so this is the question, right? Which is your relationship with your kid. And part of raising teenagers is actually doing things they do not like and having rules they do not like and having friction with them. Like that is natural to adolescence. I would also say over time, there should be a loosening, right? Over time, but just also for your time. Like you can't. You know, I mean, it's, it's a lot of work to surveil, you know, at this level. So I think you can also say, you know, this isn't forever. This is for a while. And if you show me that it's not an issue, you know, we can revisit this. All right, let's do this. will be the last question. And then we'll, but you'll, if you want to uh, ask her other questions, we'll have a reception. First of all, thank you. Um, okay, I'm concerned about communication skills mm. with our teens. Um, it makes me really sad when I see like four friends out to lunch and they're literally sitting across from each other and all four of them are on their phones. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to know if you could comment a little bit on that. But also I just think there's a, a deterioration of building social skills mm -hmm. and really learning how to um, I don't know, problem solve, like negotiate mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and actually have like valuable conversation just between themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering if you could comment on, on that. Yeah. Um, there's no question that social skills took a hit in the pandemic, for sure. And, and again, I don't say things lightly. Like I'm seeing meanness at levels I had not seen before the pandemic. I mean, kids that have very little tolerance for each other and go after each other pretty quickly. And, and it, you f I feel the effects of the pandemic in that way. So I think there's questions about where kids sit socially right now. Um, the way I would walk up to the question you're asking 
is I would ask my teenager about it. I mean, I would say, you know, I was looking at this and describe just what you described and say, should we be worried about how you're connecting or that you're connecting? I mean, get them thinking about it with you. And again, if they can feel that there's no gotcha, like you're just legitimately asking, they may surprise you. They may say, actually, <laughs> we had a three-hour conversation and we were all tired, right? I mean, like there's, sometimes there's more to it. But what we want in those moments, since we can't actually make them talk to each other, right? We don't have that kind of power. We want to surface a question or a conflict within them, right? What's this about? Is this getting in the way? Are there downsides for you? Getting them reflecting on it, which they may not do very openly with us, is the only path to getting them to change behavior. If they feel like we're trying to legislate it or we're judging it, they entrench. So the thing I love the most about teenagers, and I'll, I'll just wrap up here, right, is like they all have two sides, right? And they have the side that's like, I'm out to lunch and I want to look at my phone, so I'm just going to do it. So that's maybe their less mature, less broad-minded, less philosophical, less connected side. And they're all also incredibly thoughtful, incredibly deep, want to connect, want to get it right, you know, mature, decent. And so the part of the kid you talk to is the part you get in a conversation with. So if we come at them and we're like, why are you doing that with your phones? They're like, right. you know, you're going to get that side. And if you come at them and say, I don't know, what do you, it was kind of weird to see. <laughs> like, what do you make of that? that side will show up, and that's the side we want to cultivate. Okay. On that note, please uh, thank Lisa DeGore.